of you to our uh, monthly webinar session for January 2023. Uh, my name is Fatma Wati, and uh, I am the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, this session is, uh, re will be recorded, and the Q&A session is placed at the end of uh, the session. So therefore, should you have uh, any questions, you can either uh, ask them directly to our speaker, or you can also use the chat window to uh, type your questions. All right. So um, today's topic is uh, concrete under the microscope, uh, microstructure and image analysis, and will be presented by our respected speaker, Dr. Marcus Yeo. Uh, so, uh, before we go further, allow me to give a quick introduction to our speaker. Dr. Marcus here is uh, currently a research associate and a manager of UK CRIC Advanced Infrastructure Materials Laboratory at the Department of uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering uh, in Piri College, London. One of his research interests is on the application of different microscopy techniques to study cement-based materials, uh, which also include uh, concrete. So, uh, without further ado, Dr. Marcus Yeo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ima. So, okay. um, thank you for the intro introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure to be invited to give uh, today's talk and I have to say that I feel excited to be able to share with you, my fellow Malaysians, some of my knowledge on concrete microstructure and image analysis. And I hope that you will enjoy and benefit from the presentation today or hopefully at the very least learn something uh, new. So as Ima has already mentioned, I'm a researcher and also the lab manager uh, of the UK Creek Advanced Infrastructure Materials Lab, which is a UK national, uh, national facility for developing and characterizing novel infrastructure materials. And uh, the facility is based in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Imperial College London. You can find my email address on the slide. So if, if, you're, if you have any questions related to today's talk, or if you would like to work with us, then uh, please feel free to reach out. I would also like to point out that some of the slides uh, in today's presentation are courtesy of Professor Hong Won, who is my mentor and also the director of the UK Creek Advanced Infrastructure Materials Lab. So a bit of background about myself. So I'm originally from Cebu, Sarawak in the east of Malaysia. And here is a little map showing where uh, Cebu is in case you don't know. So this is where I grew up and attended all my primary and secondary school years. And after Form 5 SPM, I decided to move to the UK uh, to continue uh, my tertiary education. I started out doing a foundation course in physical sciences and engineering at Newcastle University. And after that, under the encouragement of my parents, uh, who were at that time involved in construction and property development, I went on to do a bachelor degree in civil engineering at uh, the University of Sheffield. And following Sheffield, I went on to pursue an MSc in general structural engineering and, uh, at Imperial College London. And that was when my interest in doing res uh, research in concrete materials had developed. Uh, had, had developed. Uh, it was also at that time that I met Ima. Yeah, so after finishing my MSc, I decided to stay on to do a PhD with Professor Hong Wong on the development of laser scanning confocal microscopy for real-time and 3D imaging of cement-based materials. After my PhD, I found myself a postdoc position at Harriet Watt University at Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, this is where I was involved in the development of eco-friendly bricks from uh, cl clay and waste gypsum. After a year at Harriet Watt, I returned to Imperial uh, to work in my current role as the lab manager for the UK Creek Advanced Infrastructure Materials. Apart from lab management, I'm also involved in teaching and supervision and also doing my own uh, research. So I think that's enough about me and I'm now going to uh, give you a bit more information about the AIM uh, lab. 
So the UK Quick Advanced Infrastructure Materials Lab was set up in 2019 with funding secured by uh, Professor Nick Bernfeld, who was also my PhD supervisor. And the money was uh, acquired, uh, was, was obtained for EPSRC, a uh, total up to 5.4 million pounds. And that funding enabled us to create and equip a new suite of uh, laboratories for processing, imaging, analyzing, and testing infrastructure materials. The main aim of the facility is to enable uh, research into the development of uh, novel infrastructure materials, which are more durable and sustainable. And also, very importantly, we, we are hoping to be able to improve existing materials as well, so that they can last longer. So the vision of the facility is to become a UK's leading university-based centre for research and education in infrastructure materials. The facility is based in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and here is a photo showing the entrance to the building. And the facility uh, was fully commissioned in 2020, and we have a web page dedicated to the facility. So if you are interested, uh, please feel free to click on the link. In terms of the research areas, uh, so within the facility, we have around seven academics, 10 postdocs, and 30 PhD students working on different research areas related to uh, infrastructure materials. And here are some examples of what we do. We have people working on new types of low carbon cement, new types of um, permeable, permeable pavement and 3D printed metals. And we also have people looking at uh, turning waste uh, such as waste feather into thermal insulation materials and waste plastics into construction units, trying to develop uh, circular economies for the good of the environment. And also people like me and Professor Hong Wong, we do research on the long-term durability and performance of infrastructure materials, which are also very important for ensuring sustainability in the built uh, environment. Obviously, we don't want building that will have to be rebuilt uh, multiple times over the course of its lifetime, right? Because that will mean the consumption of more cement, for example, which is not really an environmental friendly material. So the facility is rather unique in the sense that it was set up uh, specifically for infrastructure materials. The equipment that we acquired and also including all the accessories and software that were selected to suit our applications. We have a range of equipment for materials processing and conditioning and also for physical testing at both um, nano, micro and macro scales. And also non-destructive techniques such as resonant frequency damping analyzer, RFDA and acoustic emission. And we're also well equipped in terms of um, durability testing capability. So we have um, test rigs for molecular and ionic transport testing and doing corrosion and also electrochemistry uh, chemistry experiments. Apart from material processing and uh, processing, we also have a wide range of characterization techniques that can give us information on the physical and chemical properties of materials. So here on the pictures, uh, we have an isothermal calorimetry, and this is for studying the hydration kinetics of cement, uh, laser diffraction, uh, for the particle size distribution of powder materials. And we have MIP as well, not shown on the slide for uh, measuring pore size distribution and X-ray analysis techniques such as X-ray fluorescence for oxide composition and X-ray diffraction for mineralogical uh, composition analysis. In terms of microscopy and imaging, uh, we have a wide range of kit for preparing and producing microscopy samples. So we have high precision umbrella cutters for producing small and large samples, and also a Pelcon machine for making uh, thin sections. Epoxy impregnation kit for pore impregnation, and Schuer's branding polishing machine for producing smooth surfaces, uh, which are critical for SEM work. And along these kits, we have optical microscopes uh, dedicated for checking the quality of uh, the sample preparation. Microscopes, uh, we have electron microscopes, optical microscopes, uh, vibrational microscope, and X-ray microscope. For electron microscope, uh, this is the flagship instrument uh, of our lab. Uh, this is a few emission Zeiss Sigma 500 VP CM. It can go down to a resolution of one to two nanometers 
and is equipped, as you can see from the photo, a range of um, electron detectors and X-ray detectors for elemental and crystallographic analysis. And in addition to the Sigma, we have a very small benchtop Hitachi um, tabletop SCM, which is, which is less powerful, but extremely easy to use. So this is essentially a plug and play machine that anyone can use with very minimal training. So both microscopes, they come with third party accessories, uh, such as deep and cool stage for imaging wet specimens under vacuum by, freeze, uh, by freezing, and also a micro tensile stage uh, that can be used for real time in situ uh, observation of failure of materials under tension, for example, at high spatial resolution. So uh, here on the slide show some uh, show two optical microscopes that we have. So the first one is an axial uh, Zeiss axial image, uh, which can which can, which is capable of bright field, dark field, polarized DIC and fluorescent imaging. And on the bottom is a laser scanning confocal from Leica TCS SP5, which is capable of pseudo 3D imaging. So this technique uses a very fine laser beam to image a very small volume in the sample and pin holes uh, to filter out any other focus light. And the combination of these two features allow non-destructive optical sectioning into the sample uh, in order to produce a pseudo 3D images. And uh, I will talk more about uh, this later in my presentation. So apart from electron and optical microscope, we also have um, vibrational and X-ray uh, microspectrometers that can provide us with chemical images at high spatial resolution. So yeah, here is a Rani Show Invia Contorama microscope, which can provide us with structural information based on Raman scattering, and the Nikola infrared microscope, uh, which can provide complementary information but uh, based on infrared absorption. And uh, here we have an EDEX. Orbis PC micro X ray versions, uh, which is suitable for elemental mapping of large samples with very minimal simple preparation. Unlike SCM EDS, uh, micro X life can operate under A and hence can also be applied to uh, wax specimen. So uh, that was a very quick overview of the capability of the, uh, of the facility. And I'm now going to explain and tell you how we apply some of these techniques to look at the microstructure of concrete. And I will be focusing on backscatter electron microscopy, uh, microxa F and Raman uh, microspectroscopy. But before that, I think it is worthwhile for me to give you a quick uh, recap or intro to concrete and explain why we need to study uh, the microstructure of concrete. So concrete, and I'm sure that most of you already be aware that concrete is the second most used materials on earth uh, after water, and its usage is two times more than steel, aluminum, plastic, and wood combined. Each year, around 30 billion tons of concrete is consumed globally, so basically, concrete shapes our built environment and it underpins our modern society. And the demand for concrete is expected to increase even further from the current 14 billion millicube to 20 billion uh, millicube by 2050. However, concrete is not really an environmental friendly material as I've mentioned just now. And this is because the production of the key ingredient, the binding ingredient, which is cement, contributes to around 8% of uh, of human-made uh, CO2 emissions. Nevertheless, concrete remains a very important infrastructure materials because it is cheap, it is very strong, it is versatile, and it is uh, robust. Despite the advantages that I, that I just mentioned, concrete is intrinsically uh, porous and the amount of pore can be as high as 30% in terms of a volume fraction, uh, depending on the mix design or more, uh, more, more in the more relevant term, the water cement ratio. The pore structure is highly complex and multi-scale, ranging from compaction voids in the millimeter scale to capillary pores in the micro scale and to gel pores in the nanometer scale. And the pores not only affect the, uh, the mechanical strength, but also its durability properties, because it is these pore structures which provide uh, channels for the ingress of uh, deleterious species, 
such as uh, carbon dioxide, chloride, and sulfur ions in the presence of water. So even though the pore structure is highly complex and mostly in the very fine micrometer scale, it still allows the ingress of all these um, you know, deleterious species and causing problems um, to the concrete. So examples of durability problems uh, of concrete include chloride-induced corrosion, freestone-induced uh, damage, leaching sulfur attack in the form of thermosite and alkali silica reaction. So these are highly undesirable as they need a lot of money to repair. And in the worst case scenario, uh, the entire structure may have to be replaced with a new one, so which is which can be very costly. And therefore, uh, there is obviously a need to, uh, for us to be able to characterize the microstructure, the pore structure, okay, so as to be able to understand better uh, the influence on the durability properties of concrete. So, I believe most of you uh, would know already, concrete is a composite material uh, consisting of aggregate particles bound by a matrix of binder pace. So the key component here really is the binder pace, okay, which acts as a glue to stick the inner aggregate particles, including sand and coarse uh, aggregates such as gravel together. The binder matrix is made out of cement, so mainly Portland cement, okay, or uh, some, sometimes supplemented with supplementary cementitious material. And these, upon mixing with uh, water, forms into a workable paste that can be poured and placed uh, into, 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 into different structures. And, and that wet mix will eventually set to form a solid binder that can provide mechanical strength. However, concrete is a brittle material which is intrinsically uh, weak in tension. And therefore, for structural purposes, a steel rebar is needed. It uh, needs to be embedded in the concrete to provide um, tensile strength. So as you can see here, um, the, binding, the binder matrix, the cement paste is a very important component. So Portland cement is the most commonly used binder, as I've mentioned just now. Okay, sometimes it is uh, supplemented with supplementary cementitious materials, such as uh, fly ash, GGBS, and silica film. But Portland cement is the main, is the main, is the main, uh, is the main uh, component here. And mineralogically, it consists of four main phases, alite, b light, alite as in citrus, b light as in uh, C2S, calcium aluminate C3A and ferrite C4LF. So this figure here shows an optical uh, microscope image of a polished cement clinker etched with hydrofluoric uh, vapor. And you can see that the C3As and C2As, they form individual crystals with rather defined boundaries and shapes, whereas C3A and C4LF, they form the interstitial phase uh, in between the allied and belight crystals. So these phases, uh, when react with water, contribute differently to the setting and strength development of Portland cement. Allied and belight constitute around 75% uh, of Portland cement, and they are the main uh, compounds uh, responsible for strength. Upon contact with water, they form into calcium silicate hydrate and uh, calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide is important because it buffers the uh, pore solution to a pH of about 12.5 and above. And this, is, uh, and this ensures that the steel is protected by forming a passivation layer on the steel rebar. However, CSH, calcium silicate hydrate, okay, uh, is the far more important hydration phase because it accounts for approximately 50 to 70% of the hydration products. And it is the main phase that binds everything together, that binds the, the rebar, the aggregate, sand, and even other hydration products together. And hence, it is the one that is really providing the strength. C3A, okay, provides early strength, but contributes very little to the long-term strength. C4F has little to almost no contribution to strength. So this slide here shows a series of schematics on the formation of hydration products on the Portland cement clinker. So over time, you can see that uh, different, you can see how different uh, hydration products they form on the surface of the uh, cement clinkers. So here, the needle-like structures are etringite, 
and the fuzzy ones, they are the CSH, okay? So over time, the, 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 the cement clinker will retreat and that will be the gap between the shell of CSH on the outside and the unreacted core of the clinker. But this core will be gradually filled with inner CSH over time, resulting in a very uh, dense, densified structure. And here on the slide shows the development of microstructure of a cement piece with a water cement ratio of 0 0.4 seen under a scanning electron microscope in the bed scatter electron mode. And I'll talk uh, more about the bed scatter electron microscopy and the associated sample preparation steps uh, shortly. Here we can see that at the early age of around nine hours, the pore space originally filled with water remains largely unfilled with any solids. Okay, and the boundaries of the cement clinker uh, they are they are still relatively defined with a small amount of hydration products forming on the surfaces. As time goes by, uh, through the process of dissolution and precipitation, we can see more hydration products. Uh, forming in the, in the space originally filled with water. The remaining space in between the uh, unreacted clinkers and the hydration products are known as capillary pores, and they are the key channels through which uh, the CO2 water can penetrate the concrete and causing problems. So, here, uh, this slide here shows some cross-sectional images of concrete at different length scales taken with optical and electron microscopes. At the millimeter scale, uh, we can clearly see the even distribution of coarse aggregate particles in the concrete. And we can also see some uh, large compaction box if you look carefully. And in between the coarse aggregate particles is a continuous uh, matrix of mortar and cement paste. And if we zoom in to, into the hundreds of micrometer scale, we can start seeing uh, fine aggregate particles and also the binding cement paste more clearly. If the concrete is A and train, okay, meaning that uh, it is mixed with A and training agent for free stroke resistance, then we will see a lot of air voids of this kind at this scale. By zooming further in okay, to the cement paste, we can see the distribution of capillary pores, unreacted cement and hydrax in the order of tens of micrometers uh, below. Obviously, we can zoom in even further to the nanometer scale to observe um, CSH gel pores, for example. But for that, we will need a transmission electron microscope. So the scale bar here uh, gives you an idea of the length scales of different pore populations uh, in concrete. So compaction voids are resulted from inadequate compaction, whereas entrained air voids are from air entraining uh, a mixture for improving free store resistance. And capillary pores, so this is the tricky one because it spans a very wide range of length scales from 10 micrometers all the way down to 10 nanometers. And there isn't a technique at the moment that can scan this wide range of pores all at once. We will need to combine different techniques in order to be able to fully characterize this range of pores. CSH gel pores uh, are typically in the order of a nanometer. So we have seen a number of scanning electron uh, images already. Uh, what exactly is the scanning electron microscope and how does it actually work? And what are the same preparation steps uh, that are required? I'm going now, I'm not going to talk you through this in, uh, in this and the next few slides. So here on the slide shows uh, the few electron uh, few emission electron microscope that we have in our lab. So the key components here are the electron gun. Okay, so this is uh, the component which generates uh, the electron beam and the column through which the electron beam travels. And obviously we have a chamber uh, where the specimen stays. And this is where the interaction between the electron beam and the specimen uh, happens. And on the chamber, we have all sorts of detectors, okay, for detecting differences produced when the electron beam interacts with the sample. On the right shows a uh, corresponding schematic layout of the scanning electron microscope. 
And you can see that in between the gun and the specimen, here we have a series of uh, lenses and coils for controlling, focusing, and, and uh, rustering the electron beam across the beam, uh, across the sample, sorry. So as the beam rusters spot by spot across uh, the sample, okay, an image with different gray level intensities is formed. So SCM is very powerful. Uh, well, to be specific, I should say a few emission electron SCM is very powerful. It can achieve six orders of magnitude of amplification from 30 times all the way up to 1 million times. Okay, And this is all uh, down to the very fine diameter of the fuel emission tip, as you can see in this photo here. So you can see that the tip is no more than uh, 100 nanometers. And, 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 and this allows a very fine spot that can achieve a resolution of down to around one nanometer. So uh, what happens when an electron beam hits a sample? The beam will interact with the atoms in the sample to generate different signals, okay? So the interaction volume, okay, which looks like a teardrop, this is called the interaction volume. And the main signals uh, that are produced are the uh, backscattered electrons, secondary electrons, and X-rays, characteristic X-rays. Secondary electrons are produced as a result of the interaction of uh, the primary electron beam with the electron shells of uh, atoms in the specimen. They tend to have uh, low energies, usually less than 50 electron volt, and hence they can be absorbed easily. And this is why secondary electron comes mainly from uh, the top thin layer of the sample, as anything in below uh, will be absorbed by the sample itself before it can either travel to uh, to the surface or to the detector. And this is also why secondary electrons usually provide only uh, topological information. Backscattered electrons, on the other hand, are produced as a result of the interaction between the primary electron beam and the nuclei of atoms. So they tend to have uh, higher energies and can arise through uh, multiple scattering events meaning that they can travel from atoms to atoms before coming back up uh, the <laughs> surface. So they usually come at the top of 40% uh, of the interaction volume. Backscattered electrons are highly dependent on the atomic number of a material. If the atomic number is high, then there will be a large fraction of the backscattered electrons. Uh, and this will result in brighter uh, images or brighter pixel intensity. And if the atomic number is low, then there will be a smaller fraction of backscattered electrons. And this will result in, uh, in darker pixel intensity. And this is why and how backscattered electrons can provide uh, compositional information, especially for multi-phase samples with different mean atomic numbers, then we will be able to tell uh, what, the different, uh, what the different phases are in the sample. So to observe a, a, a concrete sample under SCM, you can simply just put a fracture piece into the chamber and then start observing, okay? No problem with that. However, if you are interested in doing image analysis, especially uh, stereology-based quantitative analysis, where 3D information is needed on 2D images, then the sample uh, must be flat and polished. Um, so as to minimize any interference from uh, any surface irregularities. And I will talk about uh, stereology after this. And the way to produce a flat and polished sample surface is illustrated on the slide. So first, so first uh, we will need to dry the sample carefully so as to remove any evaporable water from the capillary pores. And following that, we encase the sample in clear epoxy resin to, this is, this is really just for protection purposes, uh, so that it, the sample does not disintegrate uh, in the subsequent uh, steps of preparation. And following that, we turn the sample uh, outside down so that the face for imaging is facing up and the face for imaging uh, will, be, will be ground, exposed a new and plain surface for observation. 
This surface is then epoxy impregnated under vacuum to fill the pores so that the pores can be seen under the bed scatter electron mode. Okay, so as I uh, explained already just now, um, bed scatter electrons are highly dependent on the mean atomic number of the underlying phase. So if the pores are filled with epoxy resin, then uh, they will appear dark uh, on the screen because epoxy resin consists mainly of very light elements, much lighter than those you can find in the concrete itself. Okay, so it's mainly carbon and hydrogen. In addition to vacuum, okay, we also apply a gas pressure of around 2.5 bars to further push in the resin into the pores. And this is to ensure that all the pores are adequately filled uh, so as to avoid any uh, misleading observations. And once the resin sets, any surplus resin is then carefully removed by grinding using silicon carbide papers of successive, successively finer grit sizes and finally polished with diamond abrasives down to 0.25 microns in order to give us a mirror light surface uh, ready for, ready for uh, STM observation. So here, this figure here shows a bed scattered electron image of an epoxy impregnated ground and polished hardened cement piece. The water cement ratio was 0 0.4 and the curing age was seven days. So as we can see, there are different phases with different morphologies and grey levels. And they kind of like piece together to form a complete uh, image. As mentioned earlier on, under the bed scattered electron mode, the gray level varies depending on the mean atomic number. So the higher the mean atomic number, the higher the proportion of bed scattered electrons, and in turn, the brighter the phase would appear in the image. And therefore, as explained already just now, the dark phases here, there are uh, pores filled with epoxy resin, consisting mainly of carbon and hydrogen. So you can see how irregular and complex uh, the pores are. Although they look kind of like isolated in the image, but in but but in 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 in, in, in three dimensions, the pores are interconnected and they are very very tortuous. The brightest faces, uh, which are scattered around in the image, so these are the unreacted cement clinkers. And the reason why they will appear brightest is because of their relatively high contents of uh, calcium, silicon, aluminium, and in particular uh, iron in the ferrite phase of the, uh, the polling cement clinker. And in between the pores and the unreacted cement clinkers are hydrax, also of hydrax. Okay, so we have CH, CH as in polyndite, CSH or even CASH, if aluminium is in incorporated into CSH, etrinkite, monosulfate, etc. So the gray levels from each pixel can be plotted into a grayscale histogram with a grayscale range from 0 to 255. And different peaks in the histogram uh, represent different phases. And these uh, can allow us to estimate the volume fraction of the phases using image segmentation combined with uh, stereology. So what is stereology? Stereology is defined uh, as the estimation of three-dimensional parameters or measurements made on 2D uh, images. So there is no actual 3D images involved during the process. We only need a 2D image and we will be able to estimate uh, 3D information from the 2D image. Stereology does not make assumptions on the size, shape, orientation, and distribution of objects, but it does require um, randomized sampling of a large number of images to ensure uh, representative results. So stereological analysis can be uh, performed using points, lines, and, uh, and areas as props as illustrated by the schematics here. So for example, the area of object A, okay, can be, uh, if you divide this by the total area of the 2T, 2D projection, then you can get an approximate volume fraction of the object in 3D, okay? And likewise, you can do that with line and also points falling on object A. 
but in order to apply uh, stereology to uh, bed scattered electron images, uh, images of hardened cement phase, we will need to partition the image to two or more regions corresponding to the phases of interest. And the simplest way of doing this is by applying appropriate thresholds to, uh, to the image histograms, okay, in order to classify the pixels into different phases. So example of thresholding methods uh, commonly used are, uh, well, you can do it by, you can do it manually, okay, based on visual judgment, but this, this way uh, is, can, is prone to human bias, okay, because everyone will have a slightly different uh, judgment of, of the photo, of the image. The second method is the overflow method proposed by Professor Hong Wong, and this method is based on the inflection point on the cumulative histogram. Suitable, and this method is particularly suitable for pore segmentation, uh, where there is no a clear pore peak in the histogram, as shown here. And finally, uh, is the minima between peaks method, and this method is suitable for objects with distinct uh, histogram peaks such as unrated cement particles in the BSC image of hardened cement paste. Okay, so the red crosses here, they represent the minimum, the minima between peaks, uh, peaks associated with pores and hydration products and unrated cement, for example. So here is an example on estimating the volume fraction of pores and unrated cement using image cementation. By applying the threshold determined using the overflow method, okay, through the histogram of this image here, we can get a binarized image consisting of just the pores and the background, okay? And in order to determine the volume fraction of the pores, all we need to do is just to divide the total area of the pores by the total image area, okay? And this will give us a number which is the porosity which is, a, which is an estimated porosity of, of, of the cement piece. And we can also do the same for unrated cement by using the minima between the peaks of hydrates and uh, unrated cement. And uh, we, can, we can measure the total area of the cement to unrated cement and divide that by the image area to give us a volume fraction of the unrated cement. And this can help, this can enable us to determine the degree of reaction of the cement if we know what the original uh, cement content is in the sample. And degree of reaction of cement is very important because we need to know if the cement has hydrated properly or not. However, I need to point out that, you know, these numbers here, they are, they are not representative, okay, as these are the results from only one image, okay? And cement can be very heterogeneous and in order to ensure that we have um, statistically representative results, we will need to analyze a lot more images. Also very importantly, we need to note that the results here are limited by the pixel resolution of the images, especially for capillary pores, given how multi-scale uh, the pores can be, okay? So the images here are taken at 500 times, okay? And obviously there are some very small pores which cannot be picked up uh, at this magnification. An alternative to segmentation is point counting, okay? And this method is especially uh, useful for estimating phases which cannot be illustrated by image segmentation and due to their similarity in gray levels with other phases, okay? However, the phase will need to be distinguishable by our naked eye, okay, from other phases morphologically. So the way how this method works is that you overlay uh, a fine grid with equally spaced points on an image like this, okay? And, and the grid points which intersect uh, with the phase of interest is, is counted. Assuming that the counted phase is randomly distributed in the sample, the total number of points that fall on a particular phase, when you divide that by the total number of points counted, it can give you an unbiased estimate of the volume fraction of the phase. So this method uh, can be applied, for example, to unreacted slab particles, which, shares, uh, which share similar gray levels with Portlandite in slab-ended uh, cement phase. 
Uh, however, there are some dis disadvantages with this method, and they are uh, and and that uh, the method is very tedious, time consuming, and prone to human error. So here is the first example of application of backscatter electron microscopy, uh, and is 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 on the determination of the original water similar ratio of hardened concrete uh, using the backscatter electron uh, method. Okay, so water similar ratio is arguably uh, the most important parameter uh, when it comes to specifying concrete design. Okay, however, sometimes it can become the subject of dispute. Okay, uh, when the concrete does not perform to, to expectation, for example. Okay. However, the determination of water similar ratio is concrete is very difficult, uh, especially once the concrete has set. So the proposed method here is based on the fact that we can distinguish, we can readily distinguish unrated cement, capillary pools, and hydration products under the bed scattered electron mode. And we can quantify their volume fractions, as explained just now by means of image analysis and stereology. And using the data obtained and the volumetric ratios, sorry, volumetric uh, relationships between different components and the known ratio uh, between hydrogen products to red cement of around 2.1, we can compute, we can compute the initial uh, water and cement contents. And in turn, uh, this will allow us to determine the water cement ratio. So this method can also be used to calculate the degree of hydration of cement. So the main advantages of this method are that it is quantitative and it does not require comparison with reference samples. We have applied the method to, um, to concrete and mortar samples with different water cement ratios of different ages and the results obtained show that the estimated water cement ratios are, uh, uh, agree very well with, with the actual water cement ratios and 90% of them are within 0.05 of the uh, actual water cement ratios. We then further extended the method to systems containing ground uh, granulated blast furnace, slat, um, blast furnace slat or GGBS, which is a byproduct uh, of the iron and steel making industry. So GGBS is a supplementary cementitious materials that is commonly used to replace Portland cement in order to improve in order to not only improve the durability properties of concrete, but also to reduce the environmental impact associated with uh, the use of polling cement. So the proposed method here involves, involves two separate measurements. First is point counting of unreacted and reacted slat particles to determine the total volume fraction of slat. So both uh, unreacted slat and reacted slat particles that can be easily distinguished from BSC images based on the angular shape and dark coloration respect, uh, respectively. And second, heating of uh, the sample to 1000 degrees Celsius in order to establish the total water content. And we can then use uh, the data obtained and the volumetric relationships here to, uh, to determine the water binder ratio. So similar to the previous method, um, this method does not require reference standards or prior knowledge or, or prior knowledge of the binder chemical composition. And we have applied this method to cement paste with different slag content and curing edges and water binder ratios. And again, the results show that um, the method is highly accurate with mean absolute errors of around 9% for slag and around 5% for estimated water binder ratios. So uh, a very important technique complementary to bed scatter electron microscopy is X-ray fluorescence. Okay, so X-ray fluorescence can provide us with chemical information to support uh, information that we can obtain from bed scatter electron microscopy, for example. As mentioned earlier on, X-rays are one of the signals uh, generated when an electron beam hits uh, a sample in an SCM. And there are two types of X-rays generated, and there are the brain strelon, or otherwise known as the background X-rays, and the characteristic X-rays. The characteristic X-rays can be separated 
by an energy dispersive detector or, or, an, or a wavelength dispersive detector to identify the elements present in the sample. And the lightest element that can be uh, detected with an energy dispersive system is usually limited to sodium and the detection limit uh, is usually in the range of 0.1 to 0.5 watt percentage. So X-ray fluorescence can be produced not only by an electron beam in the SEM, as, as you can see here, but also by a primary X-ray beam in stand-along X5 machines. So here uh, shows a micro X5, okay? In contrast to conventional X5 uh, used for bulk analysis, micro X5 can do stock analysis, line scan, and mapping of elements at a high spatial resolution. So micro X5 employs polycapillary optics and collimating uh, optics to produce very fine beam spot size of down to 30 microns. And uh, micro X5 has a motorized stage that will allow high precision mapping of a large area. The largest sample that can be accommodated in this particular piece of uh, equipment is 270 times 270 times 100 millimeter, which is considered very big, which is considered uh, big enough for, for concrete samples, and especially, uh, especially much bigger than what you can put into an SEM. So microSF does not require much sample preparation. A simple cut surface is sufficient and no drying or other treatment uh, are required. So when an electron or X-ray beam is thrusted over a region of interest in the sample, the characteristic X-rays uh, from the spot analyzers are picked up by the detector and converted into a brightness value between 0 to 255. And that uh, will form into an elemental distribution map uh, uh, shown in, in the schematics here. So the different element maps can be combined to produce a composite image for better visualization and interpretation of results. In the case of uh, SEM, okay, the spatial resolution of the element maps is dependent on the size of the interaction volume. And this is in turn uh, controlled by the accelerating voltage and the mean atomic number of the underlying phase. So here is an example uh, of the application of micro uh, to determine the aggregate content in hardened concrete. So this method involves uh, image cementation and mathematical uh, and morphological operations to extract aggregate particles from composite images of element maps uh, acquired with micro XIF. So the coarse aggregate particles, uh, they can be separated from the fine aggregate particles by means of size distribution. So this method has been applied, uh, has been tested on concretes containing different types of aggregates, including uh, siliceous sand, uh, gravel, limestone, and sintered lightweight aggregates. And the results were compared against uh, point count analysis and the actual mix design. The values, uh, most of the values fell within plus or minus 4% of, of those point counted and the average arrows uh, in relation to the mixed design was uh, were no more than 12% for 87% of the values measured. And with the binary images okay, that we obtain from here during the image analysis, we can also analyze uh, or quantify different parameters of the aggregate particles, including particle size, aspect ratio, and orientation. Okay? And here you can see that the uh, particle size distribution, especially for the fine aggregate, they match very well with, uh, with that obtained by the conventional sieve analysis. So here's another interesting example of the application of microXIF. So the image on the left shows a cross section of a corroded rebar in a concrete exposed to chloride and the corrosion product formed around the rebar uh, caused the concrete to crack, as you can see. And the image on the right, okay, this is a corresponding uh, composite elemental image obtained with micro XIF. And by looking just at this image, you can easily guess where the ingress, where the ingress of chloride uh, is, okay? So basically, uh, 
the green bits, this is th these are the chloride ions, and you can see that the direction of chloride ingress is in this direction. So uh, this shows you how powerful macroSF can be, and how how especially for forensic investigation of an unknown concrete uh, sample. So apart from X-ray fluorescence, uh, we are now moving on to optical microscope. Okay, so Raman, uh, which is based on Raman scattering, is also a very powerful technique for chemical microanalysis. But it is based on uh, it is a kind of optical microscopy rather than X-ray or electron microscopy. Okay, but rather than elemental information, Raman microscopy provides information on chemical compounds. So Raman scattering occurs when a light interacts with uh, vibrating molecules and the frequency between the incident uh, and scatter light by vibrating molecules is known as the Raman shift. And the Raman shift um, provides the structural information on the compounds present in the sample in the form as a, of a spectrum as shown here. So this is the Raman spectrum of uh, calcite, CaCO3, and each of these peaks, they are associated with a particular vibration mode, a molecular vibration mode. So 1085, this is the characteristic peak of calcite, and it is associated with symmetric stretching of the carbonate ion. The Raman microscope uses pinhole to remove out of focus light to achieve spatial resolution in the order of uh, micrometers. And it uses it normally uses laser as a probe because the Raman, Raman signals is usually very weak. And hence we need something very intense uh, in order to, 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 to force the production or, or to enable the, de the detection of strong enough Raman signals. And Raman spectroscopy can be applied to solids, powders, slurries with very minimal uh, sample preparation. It can also be applied to gases, okay, but uh, can be a bit more tricky and you will need a special setup uh, for gases. So here uh, shows how Raman microscopy can be used to measure carbonation depth in concrete. And uh, I believe most of you would know already uh, Carbonation is a process which can lead to a pH drop in concrete and causing depassivation and corrosion initiation of uh, steel reinforcement. So here we have optimized Raman and spectroscopy to map the distribution, the spatial distributions of calcium carbonate, which is a product from carbonation and Portland light to understand uh, better the carbonation process. So during the carbonation process, uh, Portland dye is consumed, um, is consumed to form into calcium carbonate. So the advantage of this technique uh, is demonstrated here, okay, on a naturally carbonated cement paste. So nat natural carbonation is a very slow process and the, uh, and the carbonation depth can be very shallow at the beginning of the carbonation period. So here, um, the depth is around two millimeters only after three months. And such shallow carbonation depths can be very difficult to determine with the traditional phenophthalene method, okay? But as you can see here, it can be very accurately, um, you can see that the front can be very precisely mapped with a um, Raman microscope. So uh, we have applied this technique to look at the carbonation resistance of different binders and different ages, and we're hoping to, to use the data to do some long-term predictive modeling with better accuracies than uh, with better accuracies than using the phenolphthalein method. So what we have seen so far are all limited to 2D, okay? But as I mentioned at the very beginning, the microstructure of concrete or cement-based materials they are intrinsically three-dimensional, okay? Although we can use stereology to deduce 3D information uh, to some extent, there are some very important parameters such as uh, pore connectivity and tortuosity, or microcrat and LAN, which cannot be meaningfully quantified from 2D images. And therefore, we have also been trying to develop 3D imaging techniques, uh, such as laser scanning confocal microscopy and X-ray micro CT, to image and quantify poles and microcracks in 3D. So um, 
this is just a very brief overview on 3D characterization of pores and microcracks. Uh, if you are interested, and then please do take a look at the papers that we publish in cement and concrete research. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. So to conclude, um, the UK Crit AIM Lab it is a national facility for research and education in infrastructure materials lab. It is uh, well equipped with a range of um, techniques for processing and characterizing infrastructure materials. And we have expertise in characterizing, understanding the microstructure and deterioration uh, mechanisms of um, infrastructure materials, in particular concrete. And concrete durability is a very important aspect um, better to be taken into account when, uh, when we're looking at the service life of, of concrete structures. And durability is obviously dependent on the microstructure, which is multi-scale and multi-phase, and therefore is very challenging to characterize. However, uh, with the advancement of uh, technology uh, in different types of microscopy techniques, and if we combine those with um, image analysis, we can we are able to characterize the microstructure of concrete. But obviously, uh, more work needs to be done in order to develop a better approach, a more integrated approach to enable multi-scale and multi-dimensional characterization of the microstructure. So there is a lot more going than what I could cover in today's presentation. Okay, but but yeah, I think that's all that I have to say. And I hope you have enjoyed my presentation. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Okay. Uh, thank you, Marcus, for mm -hmm. a very interesting and comprehensive presentation. This is it's really interesting. It's really interesting to, to understand further uh, about the microstructure of concrete by using all of these different techniques, isn't it? Mm. Is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I hope I've not like I've tr I hope I've not covered too much for like it's not too overwhelming for you guys. No, no, it's okay. If it's like yeah. it can be like new knowledge to all of us as well. Maybe mm -hmm. some of us, yeah. Uh, okay. So um, so now we open for uh, Q and A sessions. Uh, so for all of our respected audience, if you have uh, questions. You can ask uh, directly to Marcus, or you can use the chat window uh, to type your questions. <clears throat> any anyone? Any question? Okay. Uh, while waiting, I, I think I, I have like a few questions to ask. Oh, okay. Uh, so we have one question, Marcus, uh, from yep. the chat box. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, you can read, right? Or you want me to read? Uh, I can read, yes. Okay. Yeah. So yes, um, uh, the, so the question is asking if we can get a 3D image of a hardened mortar sample using FBICM. So this really depends on your definition of 3D. Okay. If you want to get a 2D image of a microstructure which looks 3D to you, if you know what I mean. So basically, the sample is not flat, then yes, you can just use normal FBSCM. But if you really, if you want to get a three-dimensional image, so meaning that it's not just an area, but it's a volume of image, then you won't be able to do that with FBSCM. You will need to use something called uh, focus ion beam, uh, uh, focus ion beam SCM. Okay, so basically. With that technique, it uses a focus ion beam to very slowly mill slide by slice uh, into the sample, and you use the SCM to capture in, in, in a series, uh, a series of images, and then you can step the images to form into a 3D image. I hope that answers your questions. I mean, yes, you should be able to detect fiber clusters in the sample, provided, I mean, well, first of all, the fibers, they should show very distinct morphology. Uh, that you can distinguish from other faces in the concrete. So it shouldn't be a problem if you are just trying to detect fiber clusters in the sample. Obviously, it depends on the magnification and also the amount of fibers you have in the sample. If you don't have enough or if the fibers are very fine, then 
you may have uh, difficulties uh, finding the fibers, but all these can be overcome by uh, optimizing the settings of the microscope. And another question from uh, Rafisa, testing regards, regarding in situ mix, regarding to measure nucleation growth or phase at early age of new mixture. Uh, okay, I'm not really sure what you are trying to ask here. Are you asking about what technique can be used for this or? I mean, for nucleation growth and phase, you can do it with, with, um, with scanning electron microscope, no problem. But then the difficulty here is the, is the very initial sample preparation step. Because obviously, you know, when you want to look at nucle nucleation growth at early age, I mean, this usually it will be easier to, to look when the concrete is still, is still fresh, meaning that it hasn't hard hardened. And that is possible to do. But then you will have to you will have to prepare the samples very carefully, because of how fragile the uh, the, the sample can be at that early age. Yeah, I mean, I personally have not tried to do that, but I know that people have been trying to do that, and not not just with SCM, but also with uh, TEM, which is which is another level of um, of microscopy observation of cementitious materials. Okay. Uh, all right. So we have from Anand Ryan and Associate Professor Dr. Rafiza. So do we have uh, uh, more questions? We have like another three minutes to go. So you have to go at uh, <laughs> in three minutes time, is it? Yes, if that's okay. I oh, mean, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. my email address is just on the slide. So if anyone has any other questions, then you can either contact me through email or you can email me directly and I will try my best to answer uh, any questions that you may have. Uh, yes, so it is called the Focus Iron Beam SEM. It is actually a very well established technique, but then the volume that you can attain with Focus Iron Beam is very limited. So it's usually like tens of microns only. Okay. So do we have what you're, you're going to catch the tube now? Uh, yes. yes. So I'm at home at the moment, but I will need to go to the college now. Okay. Yeah. I, I can I can feel that you know uh, the nice. urgency yeah. to to go. Okay, uh, any more questions? Like two minutes. Uh, I think I have one more question. Can I have? Uh, can I ask you one question, Marcus? Yes, Imani, so of course. It's just curious, because uh, uh, probably the material that I'm going to ask is like like outside of this topic, because we mm -hmm. weren't talking about concrete. But I'm just wondering, I'm curious, like uh, how about like we have different type of sample. For example, we have a soil sample, for example, and then we want to uh, analyze using the backscatter electron, which is using SAM, right, SEM. So regarding the sample preparation, is it still like we're going to follow the, the method that we use for concrete? So again, it depends if you are if you are interested just uh, in qualitative observation or quantitative. OK, and it depends on what you are trying to, to, to characterize. So say if you're interested in the surface texture of the same particles, then you don't have to do any preparation. Basically, you just need to mount the particles on the stage and you can start observing because the, if you do any preparation, then you are kind of removing the, the, the surface characteristics on the same particles. So that would be the easiest. Okay? But, if you are, what, but, if, but, but if what you're interested in is the particle size or, or shapes, then obviously what you will need to do is to embed uh, the particles in epoxy resin, and then you do all the grinding and polishing, just like how we would do with, uh, for cement paste or concrete okay so it's the same basically the same method depend on our intention isn't it exactly depending on your intention or what you're trying to achieve and, and to do yeah okay all right i can see uh yeah. yeah that's that's very clear thank you very much okay so like we have one more minute uh and then i appreciate if we can uh take a group photo before we mm -hmm. before we finish okay, can we do that
Uh, yeah. So therefore, for our uh, audience who are still here, uh, we appreciate if you, you know, if you can turn on uh, your camera so then you can take uh, a group photo before we end the session. So Marcus, before, uh, before I forgot, so uh, yeah. on behalf of our faculty, uh, mm -hmm. we would like to uh, thank you very much for being here with us today. No problem. And I mean, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. You're welcome. You're most welcome. We really appreciate your time. And, and your knowledge. So we, we really appreciate it. Thanks, Ima. Yeah. Okay. All right. So.